Hey guys, and welcome to my channel, where we cover all things true crime, crazy and unknown historical events, ghost phenomena, and more. I also go to some of the locations that I talk about, so if that's of interest to you, definitely consider hitting the subscribe button and join my upcoming adventures. Also, don't forget to hit the bell icon so you can be sure to be notified of when I do make a post, especially right now since I don't necessarily have a set posting schedule. Today's video is going to be diving into the hired murder of Olga Kupchek, and it is a case that has had honestly little to no coverage over the years. That being said, it is an older case occurring nearly 60 years ago back in 1958. Recently this case became 64 years old, and my mom sent me an article about it from a local Santa Barbara newspaper, and once I had a moment to sit down and read through the case, I was blown away by how crazy these events were, and that I had never heard of it before. I did find it a little challenging to gather information for this video, as there is not much information that is elaborated. It's sort of just stated with little to no details, so hopefully I was able to do a good job at bringing it all together in a way that you can understand. And also, just a heads up, there is a lot of names throughout this that are mentioned, which can make it a little confusing. This case seems to have everything though. Love, deceit, incest, murder. So let's waste no time, buckle up, and let's get right into it. Let's start off by talking about Elizabeth Duncan, or as she typically went by, Ma. Yes, her name was Ma. Honestly, the more I read through this case, it made me think of that movie with Octavia Spencer, Ma. Welcome to Ma's. Probably something wrong with me. How does it feel to be on the outside looking in? Why are you doing this? This is the most fun I've had in a long time. Anyways, because she went mostly by Ma, I will be referring to her as such. Ma Duncan was born in 1904, and she lived a very peculiar life. Today she would be referred to as what we call a drifter someone who doesn't stay put in a given place for a long period of time, and they typically live life by their own rules. A drifter lifestyle can be desirable for many different reasons, depending on the person. Maybe they want to explore the world, or they desire to experience new things and meet new people without the legal or monetary constraints that life calls for. Little is really known about Ma over the years of her life, one thing we do know is that she was reported to have had over a dozen different husbands over the years, often under the guise of somehow inheriting money from them, either by alimony or outright theft. When she was cross-examined on this matter, she stated, quote, There may have been 11 men. I'm afraid to count the others. They didn't mean too much to me. She also had two kids that we know of, Frank, who we will talk about in a second, and Patricia, who died at the age of 15 from spontaneous cerebral hemorrhaging, which is described as non-traumatic bleeding of the brain caused by a number of issues, including high blood pressure. As I said a second ago, she had two kids that we know of. In other confessions with Ma, she stated that there was a total of four children and that they were all from different fathers. Frank, however, seemed to be the center of her world. According to people that knew her, her face would glow up whenever she talked about her son Frank. After passing some bad checks in late 1940, she was arrested in San Francisco, California, and this is when it was discovered that she was secretly operating a brothel in town. Although I couldn't find much information about this brothel other than that she owned it. In the early 1950s, Frank got a job in Santa Barbara as a lawyer, and his mom followed close behind. It was reported that Ma would follow her son from courtroom to courtroom, watching every single one of his cases, and applauded any of his successful wins. Behind closed doors, however, their relationship was more rocky than you may have thought. The two of them would constantly get into fights, and one night, Frank kicked out his mom, which prompted Ma to attempt suicide with prescription medications. However, the joke was all on Ma, because this wound her up at Santa Barbara's Cottage Hospital, where she was nursed back to health by a nurse named Olga Kupchek, and Frank fell completely in love. I couldn't tell from the reports how long they dated, because they did try to keep their relationship as quiet as they could due to Ma not accepting any of it. Frank and Olga ended up having a secret courthouse marriage in the summer of 1958, and because it had to be kept so secret, Frank continued living with his mother. 
Eventually, Olga discovered that she was pregnant, which prompted the couple to tell Ma about their marriage, and she was furious. Becoming overcome with jealousy and desperately trying to keep whatever relationship she still had with Frank, Ma pleaded that he continued living with her at least until the birth of their child, and Frank agreed to this. This didn't change the fact that Ma was furious about the matter, and almost nightly for three months, Ma would call Olga's house and would threaten her incessantly, frequently threatening that she would kill her if she didn't leave Frank alone. In mid-July, Ma told a friend of hers, Barbara Reed, that Olga had gotten pregnant after cheating on her son and that she was trying to trap her son with this baby, pleading if she would help her kill Olga, offering to give her $1,500 for doing so, and Miss Reed said that she would think this over, but instead of thinking it over, she informed Frank of his mother's plan. However, I wasn't able to see how he handled this information or how he reacted in general. In early August, just a few weeks after her failed murder coup, Ma was back at the drawing table again, and she arranged a meeting with a ex-convict, Ralph Winterstein, asking for his assistance in carrying out a fraudulent plan to annul the marriage of Frank and Olga by posing as them in court. Standing before a judge, Ralph, aka Frank, pleaded to have the marriage annulled due to Olga not wanting to move in with him stating that she said to him she never intended to go this far with the whole thing. At the end of the whole thing, a decree was granted in favor of Frank. A few days later, Ralph was asked to take care of Olga, but he declined the offer because he was afraid of getting in trouble with the fraudulent annulment. A week later, Ma discovered Olga's new address, and she broke in after she had gone to work stating that she wanted to just make sure that Frank's things were not there. Next, she attempted to contract one of the wives of Frank's clients, Diane Romero. Ma claimed that Olga was blackmailing her and she needed help to fix the problem, in which Diane agreed to stop by Olga's house and scope out the area. However, when Olga answered the door, Diana recognized her as the sweet nurse who had cared for her a few years prior and she quickly left after a quick visit with her. Which prompted Ma to ask Diane's husband to help get rid of Olga, but he declined to be part of this murderous plot. One night as Ma was leaving the Romero's house, she ran into the landlord of the Romero's property, Rebecca Diaz. Ma conveyed to her that her daughter-in-law was demanding money from her, and wondered if she possibly knew anyone that could help her out and Rebecca agreed that she would reach out if she found anyone willing to help. It just seems like Ma asked every single person that she ran into to help her commit this murder. To me, it's honestly shocking that she didn't get stopped sooner. Anyways, fast forward a few months to the beginning of November. At this point, Olga and Frank have been married for five months, although their marriage was annulled. And at this point as well, Ma has asked multiple people to get rid of her daughter-in-law. One evening, Ma and a friend, Emma Short, went to the Tropical Cafe in Santa Barbara. Ma knew Esperanza Esquivel, and I know I completely butchered that, but she was the owner of the restaurant, and Frank had represented her husband in a lawsuit involving stolen property. So Ma went to her and spewed the same BS that she was being blackmailed and she needed assistance getting rid of the problem. Esperanza replied that she knew some guys, but didn't know if they would be interested in talking to Ma. However, Ma and Emma Short returned to the Tropical Cafe again the next day, this time so Esperanza could introduce them to 21-year-old Luis Moya and 26-year-old Gus Baldona Baldonado. <laughs> Over the course of the conversation, they discussed several plans, and Ma stated that she would pay them $3,000 after the job was finished and also an additional 3000 within six months after the job. Finally, before the end of the meeting, Ma decided on the final plan. The two men would kidnap Olga in the middle of the night from her home and take her across the border where they would murder her and dump her body. Luis mentioned that in order to make this plan work, they would need more resources, and Ma told them that she would be right back, returning very shortly with $175, which is worth about $1,700 today, saying that she pawned a few of her rings. Luis was a petty thug who had a relatively bad record. From the age of 11, he was a frequent drug user, 
and by 12 he was already frequenting houses of prostitution. Some of his past offenses included theft, burglary, possession and smuggling of narcotics, and also stabbing a person with a knife. He spent several years in jail and at least one year in the state penitentiary. Records from this time show that he was not a cooperative prisoner, and he actually also made several attempts to escape over the years. In regards to Gus, I was unable to find any information on him, but if he was hanging around Luis, I don't think he was that great of a guy either. On the evening of November 17th, 1958, the pair rented a car from a friend for $25, and then they headed to Olga's apartment. Olga, who was seven months pregnant at this time, heard a knock on her front door, and she answered it. Luis told her that Frank had been out drinking with him, and he was extremely drunk in the car, and Luis needed her help getting him inside the house. Once Olga had opened the rear passenger door, Luis pistol whipped her, and Gus, who had been hunched over in the back seat to look like a drunk Frank, pulled a now unconscious Olga into the back seat with him. Their plan was seemingly going well, however, about 30 minutes into their drive down to Mexico, the car began having issues. So instead of following the original plan, they drove into the mountains near Ojai, which is part of Ventura County. They dragged Olga out of the car and down into a culvert that ran under the road, which was pretty hidden if you were standing on the road looking down. Because the pistol had been used to knock her unconscious, it was pretty damaged, and at this point it was not able to be used. Instead, Luis and Gus took turns strangling her. After a while, they couldn't feel her pulse, so they began digging a hole to bury her. And because this was not part of the original plan, the men had no tools to bury Olga, later telling police that they had to dig the shallow grave with their bare hands. After returning to Santa Barbara, Luis and Gus hid their bloody clothes and the seat covers that were covering the seats. They had also tried to clean the car by sweeping it and spraying a substance to hide any blood spots. The next day they brought the car back and told the owner that the seat covers had been burned by a cigarette that they accidentally dropped, and that they would give her money for new ones. Not sure how this person reacted, but honestly, I don't know how they would believe that all of their seat covers were ruined from one cigarette with no other damage to the car, but I don't know. Louise contacted Ma and informed her that they had performed their part of the bargain, and she told him that she had not been able to go withdraw any money out of the bank because the police had been inquiring about Olga's disappearance. Soon after their conversation, though, Ma went down and cashed a check that Frank had given her to pay for a typewriter, and she met Luis downtown Santa Barbara at a store, handing him an envelope containing $150. A week later, at Ma's request, Emma Short left an envelope for Luis with the cashier of a restaurant. The envelope was addressed to someone named Dorothy, and it contained $10. Luis obtained it by saying that this money was for his aunt. Ma was quickly questioned by Frank about this check that he had given her for a typewriter, and she pulled out her oldest trick in the book, stating that she was being blackmailed. However, Frank was beginning to grow very suspicious of his mother, so he informed the police that he thought his mother was involved in some way in Olga's disappearance, and that he believed that's why she was being blackmailed. The investigation which followed resulted in the arrest of Luis and Gus. Olga's body was recovered on December 21st, and the pathologist found that Olga's death was caused by head wounds and strangulation, or suffocation by being buried alive. A few days after Luis was arrested, he asked to see a minister, and Reverend Floyd K. Gresset came to the jail in response. Luis testified that when he talked to Reverend Gresset, he got on his knees, and for the first time in his life, he asked God for forgiveness. Reverend Gresset decided that Luis was sincere and was ready to confess to God and man, and immediately after this, he confessed to law enforcement officers that he had murdered Olga. Psychiatrist Dr. David R. M. Harvey testified that Luis had a sociopathic personality who profits from neither experience or punishment, that he was a constant danger to society, and was capable of murder right now. Dr. Harvey also said that a sincere religious belief is a good start toward rehabilitation, but the period of time during which Luis had held such beliefs was too short to permit a determination as to the 
validity of his conversation. On the stand in her own defense, Ma denied any knowledge or involvement in Olga's murder and said that the payments to Luis and Gus were made because Esperanza had threatened her because she was unsatisfied with Frank's legal help. But the jury didn't buy any of this, and all three were sentenced to death. Three years later, on August 8, 1962, Luis and Gus died next to each other, strapped into the metal chairs of California's gas chamber. When Elizabeth Duncan was led into the chamber shortly after, she looked around and noticed that her son was not there. Instead, he was in a federal court trying to win a last-minute reprieve for his mother. Where is Frank? were Ma's last recorded words. And Ma's execution was the last female execution done by gas chamber in California. Since then, numerous men and women have been executed for their crimes, but by lethal injection. Up until this point, execution was a prevalent form of punishment. But after Ma's death in 1962, Executions went from 8 to 12 a year, down to 1 or 2 every 2 to 4 years, and the biggest gap in years where an execution did not take place is between the years of 1967 and 1992. But that is going to do it for today's video. Hopefully I was able to tie it all together concisely, because there wasn't too much information that I could find other than a few sources. I'm definitely interested to hear what you guys think of this case. Are you surprised that she didn't get caught sooner considering how many people she attempted to bring into this? I personally thought it was surprising that a crime like this one is not super well known, because there were multiple times throughout that I was kind of shocked about what I was reading. Also, what are your thoughts on the death penalty? Do you think it's an appropriate form of punishment? Personally, I don't agree with the death penalty. The biggest reason being I think the person who committed such a heinous crime that results in a death sentence should live out their days locked up because death is not a form of rehabilitation, especially since so few actually make it to their death sentence and typically die of natural causes in death row which seemingly has better conditions than a normal prison does. I'm definitely curious about your thoughts on all of this. Don't forget to subscribe for more of my upcoming cases and adventures, and make sure to hit the bell icon if you do want to stay in the loop about when I finally make a post. But as always, I appreciate any and all support, and I will see you on my next upload.